All right, I think it's four o'clock. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Individual Excellence Awards, Five Things to Know Before You Apply. This is part one of our three-part individual artist webinar series, so stay tuned for more information about parts two and three of the series at the end of this webinar. My name is Katie Monahan, and I'm a communications strategist here at the Ohio Arts Council. And joining me today are Kathy Signorino, Director, and Katie Davis, Coordinator of the Individual Artist and Present for Art programs here at the OAC. As promised, Kathy and Katie are here to share their wisdom about the Individual Excellence Awards grant program, but before we dive in, there are just a few housekeeping items I need to go over. First, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. This just helps cut down on any feedback issues during the presentation. But that does not mean that you have to stay silent. If you have a question at any point during the webinar, absolutely feel free to ask. There are two ways to do this. So for those of, us, for those of you joining us in Zoom, go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A box located in your control panel. And for everyone tuning in on Facebook, please type your questions in the comment section of the live stream. My colleague Amanda Etchison and I will monitor questions in both locations and we'll be sure to leave plenty of time for our dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Next, if you have audio issues or trouble connecting, we recommend refreshing your browser. And if that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back in. And finally, we are recording today's webinar and the recording will be available on our webinar page and on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. So if you aren't able to listen to the entire webinar today, or you want to go back and re-listen or share it with a friend or a colleague, you'll be able to find it in either of those locations. All right, I think that does it for housekeeping items. Time to get down to business. So as I mentioned, today's speakers are Kathy Signorino and Katie Davis of the OAC's Individual Artist and Percent for Art programs. A little bit of background on these ladies. Kathy, who many of our listeners may know, has been with our agency for quite a long time. She is currently in her 26th year here at the OAC, and she's been working with the Individual Artist Program for 21 of those 26 years. So be prepared to learn some sage advice from Kathy today. Hey, Kathy, how are you? I feel good, thanks, excited to be here. We're glad to have you here. And then Katie, on the other hand, is the OAC's newest employee, and she comes with an invaluable set of skills as both a studio artist and a teacher. So Katie, how are you doing today? Doing fine. Hi, everybody. We're glad to have Katie here with us, both as a new OAC team member and as a webinar presenter. So we're excited to have both of these ladies here today, and they are excited to share their knowledge and to help you prepare your best Individual Excellence Awards application. Today, they'll provide an overview of the program, they'll walk you through the guidelines, and offer guidance on writing your narratives, preparing your support materials, and accessing the RD application system. They will also go over what happens during a panel meeting. So clearly, we have a lot to cover today, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Kathy, Katie, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Most of you know that the Ohio Arts Council know about us and the resources that we provide. Others are new to the agency, so let me share that the Ohio Arts Council is a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences to strengthen Ohio communities culturally, educationally, and economically. With funds from the Ohio Legislature and the National Endowment for the Arts, the OAC provides financial assistance to artists and arts organizations. The council accomplishes this charge in two primary methods. First, through the various grant funding programs that the council operates um, to provide support to artists and to make arts activities available to a broad segment of Ohio's public. And secondly, by providing services that help to enhance the growth of the arts. Our agency is led by Donna Collins, Executive Director, and Deputy Director, Dan Katona. We are thrilled to work with the OAC leadership and staff to carry out our mission, which includes supporting Ohio's artists. Before applying to any grant program at the Ohio Arts Council or otherwise, it's best to read the full guidelines. You can find our guidelines on the OAC website, oac.ohio.gov, under grants forward slash individual artists forward slash individual excellence awards. There's a PDF there that provides all the details that you'll need to know. But before we dive any deeper, it would be great to get a feel for who's tuning in today. Um, please go to the poll, it's gonna pop up that we've posted in Zoom and let us know your artistic discipline. 
and the region of the state where you live. Um, this is going to help us get a good idea of who we're reaching through our webinars. So the first one that's going to pop up is yeah. Oh, sorry, Katie. Yeah, here, um, yeah. Before we get to this, Kathy, there is a black rectangle on your screen that you are sharing. Are you seeing that? It's covering the right hand side of the screen. Oh, is this is it better? No. There you go. It's, okay. It's better. Thank you. So sorry, sorry, about that. So sorry to interrupt. <laughs> okay, so yeah, sorry about that. Um, sorry, everyone about that. We got our tech difficulties fixed there. Um, we will go ahead and launch the poll that Katie was referring to. So sorry to interrupt, Katie. No, that's fine. So yeah, the, you're going to see a poll pop up for your artistic discipline. And go ahead and take a time. There's a lot of options there and pick which one and then hit submit. I'm going to give you a few moments. And Kathy, the rectangle showed up again. It might be that poll. <laughs> I think it'll go away. Okay, it looks like we almost have everybody in. We'll give you just a few more seconds. And let's see, here you go, Katie. Here are your results. Okay, great. It looks like most of you are from the visual arts 2D category. We also have a high representation from media arts and crafts, and we have photography, visual arts 3D, and we have um, a few others as well. So yeah, thank you everybody. That's great. Okay, the next um, poll that's gonna pop up is for your region of the state. So if you can take, I think there's five options there for you. So just pick the region of your state and hit submit. I'm gonna give you a few moments. We just wanna see where everybody's from today. All right, give you just a few more seconds. We almost have everybody in here. All right, and here you go, Katie. Okay, great. It looks like most of you, the 43% are from the Northeast part of the state. And we have 38% from Central Ohio with the Southwest represented and the Southeast. So thank you, everybody. All right. Great. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what these Individual Excellence Awards actually are. Um, these are awards of excellence for past work by Ohio artists. We are fortunate in Ohio to have so many creative artists Define a creative artist as the originator of artistic idea. This means that the playwright, not the actor, the choreographer, not the dancer, the composer, not the musician, can apply to this program. Individual Excellence Awards recognize the exceptional merit of an Ohio artist past body of work. Awards celebrate the creativity and imagination that exemplify the highest level of achievement in an artistic discipline. Awards are typically $5,000 and may be used for a variety of expenses related to an artist's growth and development. Awards may not be used for enrolling or continuing in a degree granting program and recipients must remain in the state during the grant year. The work you are submitting must have been completed within the last three calendar years. There are a few exceptions to this timing, so make sure to read the full guidelines for your discipline. To be eligible to apply for the program, you must be an Ohio resident living and working in the state for a year prior to the September 1st deadline. Applicants must be at least 18 years of age, students attending high school or students pursuing undergraduate or graduate degrees at, at the time of application may not apply. Applications are being accepted this year in the visual disciplines, which include crafts, design arts, interdisciplinary arts, media arts, photography, visual arts 2D, and visual arts 3D. Next year, we will accept applications in the disciplines of choreography, music composition, and the literature categories. Applicants may only submit one application per year. If you work in multiple disciplines, for example, photography and sculpture, you will have to decide which is the stronger body of work and apply with that. If you need more information or help in thinking about which discipline you should consider, you can always email us, or our contact information is on our website, and our email will be available at the, on the screen at the end of the webinar. 
Collaborative applications are accepted if both artists are the creators of the body of work being submitted. Applications are reviewed through an anonymous peer review process. When you read the guidelines, it is important to note specific requirements for your discipline. Pay attention to how old the work can be, what your required support materials are, and how many works can be submitted. These sections of the guidelines are also in the support materials section of the RD application. Now that you've read the guidelines, you're ready to begin the next step. We suggest that you prepare your narrative statement and philosophy in a word processing program before entering it into RD. Each statement can be no longer than 250 words. After 250 words, the statement will be cut off. The narrative statement is unique for our purposes. It's not an artist statement, but instead a literal description of the work you are submitting. Since the panel is viewing documentation of your work, you will want to use this statement to fill them in on what they're seeing in the documentation. The philosophy statement tells panelists why you have created the work you are submitting. If this is a continuation of a body of work you've done for a while, or if this is a new exploration. Here's an important hint as you begin writing. Our panelists will not know your name. The narrative you submit should not include biographical information. We want to provide our panelists with works of art, not bios, as they consider your full, your full application. If there's any biographical or resume information in these statements, it will be taken out prior to panelists having access to it. Now, if there's important information that's necessary for the understanding of your work, for example, if your work explores your Latino heritage, it's fine to state that. There are some things that you should include in your narrative statement to help direct panelists to certain works in your support materials. You can use image numbers. You should break the statement into paragraphs for ease of reading. You can talk about images one to three, images four to six, images seven to nine, and 10 to 12 in separate paragraphs. Images do not need to be displayed in the application in chronological order. Instead, think of how they read together while you organize your images and writing your accompanying narrative. Preparing your digital support materials. You've, read, you've written your narrative and philosophy. Now it's time to prepare your images for your application. Since the panel is only seeing documentation of your work, you will want to be able to, you want them to be able to understand what is going on within the work. So it is very important that your documentation quality be at its best. The OAC uses an online grant system called ARTI to accept its applications for its grants programs. We will explain how to register for ARTI and get into the system in a bit. But in preparation for uploading your support material to ARTI, you need to size your digital images to a square masked size of 1920 by 1920 pixels and 72 DPI. The JPEG images should be between one and two megabyte file size. There is a handy PDF with step-by-step -step instructions on how to resize your images for ARTI on our website on the individual artist page, oac.ohio.gov forward slash artist two. If you're applying in the media or in a disciplinary disciplines, you can upload media files to ARTI directly if they are less than two gigabytes in file size. For larger size, File sizes, you need to enter the URL for a sharing site like YouTube or Vimeo. When you're deciding to order the order of your images, there are some things to keep in mind. The images appear in rows of three, so they read together as a set. You will want to think about how each image plays off the other ones in that grouping. These images from Columbus artist Laura Sanders, a FY19 Excellence Award recipient, demonstrates how to order your images. The initial set of three images should wow the panel and make them sit up and take notice. The next series of six images, three at a time on view, can show how you have explored your subject further. The last set of three images should leave them with something to remember. If you're including details, they should always be shown to the right of the full size image. Remember, your images do not have to be submitted chronologically. They should be curated to make sense together and to show well as a whole. If you only have 10 or 11 strong images that work well together, do not add an additional image to round out the 12. It is better to submit less work that is a cohesive body 
than to ever have the panel say, is this the same artist? In applications that allow for multiple types of support materials, the digital images appear first in the panel review, and then the video and audio materials. For disciplines like interdisciplinary, you can submit a lot of support material to document your work. So look for these details in the guidelines. If you are a sculptural installation artist and your work includes audio, video, or movement, you should submit in the interdisciplinary category to allow for the sharing of these aspects of your work. So now that you have your narrative and philosophy written and your support material prepared, it's time for you to begin your RD application. If you have never applied through RD, you will need to create a registration. To do this, go to ohioartscouncil.smartsimple.com. There's a handy link on our grants page um, on our website as well. You will see the register button at the bottom of the page. If you applied in the past and aren't able to log in, you may need to simply click on the forgot password button and the temporary password will be sent to you. After completing the registration process and logging in, you will land on the RD homepage. You will see that you can navigate by clicking on the menu at the top of the page or on the icons below. When you're first in the system and want to start an application, you will select be begin a new application. Next, you're going to see the grants programs available to you. Select the individual excellence awards. When you log into RD the next time, you will click the open and active application tab to get back into your in progress application. You can move in and out of your application in RD 24 seven until the day of the deadline. Um, the deadline day is September 1st, 2020, with your last chance to submit at 5 o'clock that day, 5 p.m. that day. RD is user-friendly, and one advantage is that your application and support materials are saved, so you don't have to worry about completing an application in one setting. When you get into your application, you will notice that it has assigned you an application number. It's important to keep note of this number because you will need it when corresponding with the Arts Council and also during the panel review. The first thing you'll need to answer is if you're applying with a collaborator. We allow two artists working together on one body of work to apply together. If indeed you are applying as a collaborative team, each artist must be an Ohio resident and not a student. Each artist would make an application with their collaborator name noted on their application. Each collaborator will submit the same narrative, but only one of the co collaborative pair will submit the support materials. If awarded, you will split the award equally. Now, if you're not applying as a collaboration, um, you would just say no to that question. At this point in the application process, you will enter your narrative and philosophy. You will cut and paste from your word processing program document. You'll probably have to use the function of control C and copy um, to copy and control V to paste in the RD system. Keep watch for your word counts at the bottom of each section. We suggest that you also ask a friend to look over your narrative to see if it makes sense to them when looking at your support materials. Congratulations, you're well on your way in the application process. To show you how to do the step-by-step -step process of uploading your digital images, I have created this video. Let's watch. The first part of uploading your digital images to the RD application is to hit the support materials tab of your application. You're going to select the discipline that you're applying to. Most of the disciplines, when you select them, have support sub-disciplines associated with them. That is true of design arts, crafts, media, and visual arts. Photography and interdisciplinary does not have subdisciplines. So for visual arts, you're going to select the subdiscipline. In addition, if your work is 2D or 3D, that will determine which panel it is reviewed by. As you saw as I went through this process, the support materials required for the discipline changes. So you can always make sure that you're submitting the right support materials. Once you do that, then you open the digital image uploader. It opens a window in another screen. Within there, you hit the open worksheet. Here has all of the information that you need to submit for each of your images that you're uploading. I am going to submit 
a work that has been resized to the proper 1920 by 1920 size, and then one that has not been. So you can see the difference and the importance of resizing your images. I am going to name my artwork and my medium. When it gets to the date, the most important thing is to look at the calendar year and then tell us the approximate time that you created the work. We are going to then put in the dimensions. And then once we have, and also note for a 2D work, we always make it a zero. And then we also can select between inches and feet. If there's additional information that is important for the panel to know about your work, you can include it in the artwork description box. So I want them to know that there is a thick layer of paint throughout this work. And once we have that completed, we hit image upload. Here we're looking for the file on our computer that has our information for our application. We upload that, shows us that it's complete. There's our image and we close this box down. The most important thing next is to add this image to our application. Once you get this blank page, this confirmation page, all you do is close it out in the corner. When you scroll down and hit save on your application, your image appears. Let's do that again, but with the image that is not sized correctly. So we open our worksheet, we put in our information, I'm going to image this as image number two, just because I want to show you how to reorder images as well. I'm going to name this Happy Clown 2, just so that we are straight on what we're doing. Acrylic on canvas. I'm going to again choose my date by the year. And then put in my dimensions. And I'm keeping that as inches. And then I'm going to hit image upload, find my image on my computer. This time I'm finding the one that has not been resized. And I'm uploading that complete. There it is. It looks okay to me. We're going to close that window and then we're going to add this image to our application. There's that blank window again. You just close that down. We hit our save. We scroll down the page and there's our two images. As you can tell that the image gets skewed on in the RD application if it hasn't been resized. So that's why it's very important for you to resize your images. The next thing I'm going to do is show you how to reorder the images. It's very simple. So once you have all your images uploaded and you decide you don't like the way that they actually look and, and the order and how they read together, then you can reorder them. All you have to do is when you see the titles of your works on this side, decide where you want them in the order between 1 and 12. So let's say we want this one to be number 2 and this one to be number 1. And we hit save. Gives it a little minute. We close this window. And there, there, there they are. The next thing we can do is if we decide we don't like an image, we can delete it. So all you have to do is hit delete. It'll say, are you sure you want to delete this image? Of course you say, okay. And 
now you have your one image. It has automatically renumbered it for you to be number one. So when you do delete out images, it will reshuffle the order of the images. So once again, you might have to go back to your images and renumber them. As you can tell, this one says it's number one, but you actually have it as number two. So just make sure that once you have all of your images uploaded, that you have them in the right order that you want them. And that's how you upload your images. Great, now we've uploaded our images and we are going to learn how to upload some of the other digital um, support materials that we accept for the other disciplines. I've created another handy tutorial to help you through this process. Now that you've uploaded your digital images, there are some disciplines that require you to upload AV materials as well. These are media arts and interdisciplinary. So in the interdisciplinary category, we're going to use that as our example because it allows for the most amount of audiovisual materials to be uploaded to the application to support the artwork that's being done within that discipline. So the first thing you do is you'll see that I do have one, my image still uploaded from when I did it previously. So to upload some other types of AV materials, I would open the work sample uploader. Again, just like with our digital images, a window pops open, but this is slightly different because it allows for a link to a, sh a video sharing site like Vimeo or YouTube. We do that because Artie has a two gigabit by file size maximum for its videos or audios. And so in order to do a full size film or video, you would have to put it on a sharing site. I'm going to, I have my document open with my information for my excellence award that I am applying with. So here is a link to my, to my film that I've created. I'm actually using a film by Simon's Cats as my example. I typically you would put as the director the applicant name. I'm going to go ahead and put Simon Tofield in here. So for the credit, if you have an art director or somebody like that that you want to give credit for within your application, you can definitely do that. The description, again, can give any kind of additional information that is helpful to the, for the panel. Of course, it has to be anonymous, but you can put the length and the runtime of the piece, or if there's additional like music credits, that is perfectly fine to do that. We're gonna put our date again. Remember, we're going mainly for the year. And then you have to, you do have to select the date. Once we have that, what we do, just like in the other, we have add work sample. It's looking again for our file upload. I am choosing my video. I'm uploading it. It's less than two gigabytes, so it will upload. I close this box down. I hit save draft. I go, I close this box, I go down to my application and I hit save. And we look, and there is my Simon's Cats video. Now for this discipline, I also want to upload a schematic, which is a document. So what I do is I just hit open worksheet. I didn't have to put my URL because this is an actual document that I'm uploading to the actual uh, RD application. I'm okay, again, gonna put in applicant here. I'm gonna let them know this is a schematic of the gallery floor. And then again, I'm going to put the date. It is a required field, so we're going to go ahead and make sure that we have that date in there. And 
and I'm going to add my work sample again. And this, again, allows you to upload these types of files within this program. I'm going to upload this PDF. Uploading it, it's complete. I close my box down. It sometimes asks you about this information. Just say leave page. I scroll down to the bottom. I hit save. And there's my two bits of information. One thing you'll notice on the work samples is that it's not going to give you a image like this. It is just going to give you the title of the piece and the other information. The other information that you created when you enter this information is actually provided to the panel as an exported document um, so that they get all of that text um, metadata up for those different bits of support materials um, with your application. So don't worry about that. Even though you don't see it here, the panel will get that information. All you do is hit save and you're ready to move on to the next part of your application. Next, we have um, an optional survey for you to complete to help us with some demographic information. This information is for reporting to the National Endowment for the Arts and in no way will be shared with the panel and does not affect um, any decision making. So you can see that survey. A few different steps to it. All right, so you've completed your narrative and philosophy and uploaded your support material. Now it's time to check that application and submit. First, you're gonna click the save button at the bottom of the page. Then before clicking the submit box, you'll wanna check for errors. Once this is done and there's no errors um, found, then you can click the I have reviewed the application in full button and verify that you are a resident of the state of Ohio and not a student in a degree or certificate granting program and then you click Submit. Now, for one of the best parts, you'll receive an email from Artie alerting you that your application was successfully submitted. There's an optional survey that allows you to give us some feedback that you can complete, and we hope you will. It helps us better our services. You'll receive another email from Artie in early October alerting you to the details of the panel meetings, which will be held in December. You wonder probably what happens actually at a panel meeting. We will be holding the panel meetings in December to review the submitted applications. We promise to keep you up to date with all the details for these panels as they become available. The panelists that serve on our panels are arts professionals who will be comprised of a mix of experiences in their specific disciplines, as well as demographically diverse with a variety of male, female, ethnicity, age, and geographic location. Panelists will be provided with your support materials, your narrative and philosophy, and your AV information. That is all. No biographical information will be shared with the panel. The panel works through a series of review rounds to make their selections. Each panel uses a set of review criteria when viewing the support materials you submit. They make recommendations based on any combination of this criteria. This criteria is listed in our guidelines. December is here. The panel meeting is over, and I'm sure you're wondering what the next steps are. First, you will receive an email from Artie in January to let you know if you have been recommended for an award or not. If you are recommended, then we ask you to provide proof of residency and non-student status as we prepare your recommendation for our board's consideration. The OAC board reviews recommendations at its first meeting of the calendar year. When they approve the recommendations and we receive your proof of residency materials, we will begin processing your award agreement. When you accept your award 
and register as a supplier with the state's shared services database, we can process your check payment. The day has arrived. Your funds have been deposited into your checking account. Now what? Well, lucky for all of us, you can use the funds however you think it will be best support your future art making. You can buy supplies, pay studio rent, pay for a babysitter so you have studio time. You just need to remain in the state during the grant period and may not use the funds to go to school. We ask you to publicize your award and complete a final report about the effects of the award on your art making by December 31st of the same year of your award. Best of all, you can apply again in two years with a new body of work. All right, thank you so much, uh, Kathy and Katie. That was a lot of information that we just covered pretty quickly. Um, so we'll get ready to open up the floor to questions in just a minute. I just wanted to remind everybody that if you missed the beginning part of this, um, the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel and on our uh, website later this week, along with a copy of the slide deck. So if you wanted to go back and look at those slides, you'll get everything there. Um, Again, for questions, if you're joining us in Zoom, remember to type your questions into the Q&A box. And for our Facebook friends, go ahead and comment on the live stream. Um, it looks like we've got some great questions already, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. Um, are individual excellence awards open for just personal work, or can an artist submit work created for a corporation in Ohio? Sure. Take that. <laughs> sure. This this is the um, the issue we have a lot with our designers because they are making work for their company that they are designers for. So that actually is a um, it's a personal um, a personal decision that you have to make yourself if you feel like you have ownership over the work. That is the number one key. Um, component to anything of our of our grant programs is who owns this work? Do you have the creative? Do you own the creative product? And if you own the creative product, then definitely. If you are if you have created work for a client, say in the design arts category, or even um, maybe a media based work, then you could definitely if it's if, if they paid you to do this, but it's still your artistic work, then you can definitely apply with that work. If so if, on the other hand, um, you have some kind of agreement with your company that says, we own whatever you do for us, then unfortunately, no. But we definitely have a lot of, um, of designers that are freelance designers that apply within the design arts category. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Um, we've gotten a few questions. This, this next question we've gotten from quite a few people. Um, can you talk a little bit about like how many war how many awards are presented annually? Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we are very fortunate, and um, we are able to give out seventy five awards per year. Um, in the past, it's been seventy five five thousand dollar awards. So that is um, three hundred seventy five thousand dollars that we've been able to award. And the number of awards per discipline is based on the number of applications that are received within that discipline. So, uh, of course, um, the larger volume of applications come in our Visual Arts 2D category on our visual year. And so the larger portion of the budget goes to that. So what we try and do is hold our applicant to awardee percentages at about 16 to 18 percent, which is a very high number. Um, when I started this program, um, so not I didn't start the program, but when I started with the program so many years ago, that number was between 8 and 10 percent. So right now we are awarding more awards than we have in many, many years, and so our percentages are really great. We're still getting a lot of applications, so it's just that the, uh, the council has decided to give that many awards to our artists. So. Fantastic, thank you. Um, their questions are just rolling in like rapid fire here, you guys, so <laughs> buckle up. Um, can one of you talk about a little bit about the difference? You talked about the narrative and the philosophy. Can you talk about the difference between those two, dive into that a little more? Katie, do you want me to take it? Are you, do you want to do it? Oh, I don't know. She's okay. muted. <laughs> um, <laughs> her mute is stuck. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, well, so when when Katie was talking about the narratives, these really are a literal description of uh, what you're submitting. So think of it in a way of saying if you had five minutes to sit before the panel and describe what they're seeing, that's what this, this narrative is. The philosophy, of course, is your motivation of why you're doing this work. It also can fill in the panel um, a little bit about if this is a new direction in your work, if this is a new exploration, if the, you know, what you're motivated by, if, if you, um, the example we had is that if you're a Latino and you're, and you want to explore your Latino heritage and um, that is important within your work, then of course you could include that information in your narrative. So that is what the philosophy is about. We call it a narrative. Both sections are part of what we call our narrative, but the narrative part is the literal description and the philosophy is really the motivation behind why you do your work. Kathy, that offered a little bit more of a deep dive into the clarification there, kind of building on that question relating to the narrative and philosophy statements. Somebody is asking if the jurors read those before they view the, before they view the examples so that they understand the context. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, I can. Um, it, it's, a, it's a matter of volume. Um, we are still exploring the options that we might have for this particular year, which might allow us to uh, have the panelists have more time with those um, with those narratives. And that is because we are exploring the option of having to go to a virtual um, panel meeting process, which means the materials would get they would get those materials ahead of time to review. Um, that, like I said, we're, we're still exploring that option, but for the, I can tell you for the literature years that we do send all the materials out to our panelists ahead of time. They do get all of those narratives ahead of time. They get them two months ahead for their reading um, to go along with the, with the manuscripts that they're reading. On certain panels, when we have our in-person panels, it really is the volume of the applications within that discipline if they're able to um, read in depth on those narratives before they see the work. So it, it kind of uh, unfortunately depends on the discipline. So I don't know if that helps much, but what we do for the work that is stronger, we do give lots of time for the panel to pause, to look at that work, to look at that narrative statement, to read, to ask questions about the narrative statement, and um, and and on the two-day panels that we had in person, if they ever wanted to take any of those narratives with them back to the hotel room to read them, we allowed that as well. That's great. Um, let's see. Somebody, we'll stick with the we'll stick with the narrative um, track here. It seems to be a popular one. Um, with the narrative, do you are you looking for technical documentation or narrative story? Can it be both? Can you, and you touched on that a little bit actually earlier, but we'll follow up. Yeah, so again, it's, it's interesting um, that the narrative means different things to different panels. Um, so a narrative written for a crafts panel might be really different than a narrative that is written for a sculpture panel. So the crafts panel tends to wanna really know about the process. They want to know what materials you use, um, what fire you know level you used on your clay? I mean, they want all that nitty gritty information about how you created your work in that narrative. Um, the sculpture, the sculpture might be uh, a little bit more interested in um, maybe your motivation behind the work, what materials that you encompassed within the work, how the work was displayed. That is really important um, for a sculptural panel to know what the setting is for that sculptural work, if it's installation based, if it's, um, if it's out in the public, any of those things should be addressed in the narrative. Uh, the prime example of an important narrative is in the interdisciplinary category where we have installation based work, where there could be components on the wall, but then there could also be things on the floor, there could be audio playing, all of these things. So what we often explore have the or make the suggestion to the applicants to use your narrative 
to walk the panelists through the space. Tell them literally, as you go, as you come into the gallery space on the right, you will see a series of paintings that I've done that have um, videos embedded in them. And then, um, and then talk about like sculptural elements that might be on the floor. And so those kind of things are important and they're interdisciplinary. So we are perfectly willing to, if you have specific questions about what should be included in your narrative, Katie and I are here to answer those questions for you. You can reach out to us. We often, we didn't put this in our, um, in our PowerPoint and we should have done this is that we are here in the months of June, July, and August to help you with your application. So we are here to answer those questions. You know, I'm applying, I'm not sure, should I apply in sculpture? Should I apply in crafts? Because I do clay and I do sculptural clay elements. Which one should I do? So Katie and I are here to answer those type of questions. We will have you email or upload your work to the RD application, we can look at your narrative, we can make suggestions as to ways that might make it clearer for the panel. All of that is, um, is what we do for all of our applicants. So definitely reach out to us if there's something specific that you are wanting to know about your specific type of discipline, then we can help you with that. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy and Katie are a uh, wealth of information and resources, and they're always happy to help. So yeah, I definitely encourage you to reach out. They're, they're great. <laughs> so um, we talked. you talked a little bit about, you referenced galleries in your last answer there. Um, here's a question for you. Um, if somebody has a piece of work that's been displayed in a gallery, should they upload images of gallery installations, you know, showing it as part of, the, part of an exhibition? If it is important to the understanding of the work. So um, just to show, to use one of your 12 slides to show an installation just because you want to show that you had your work in a gallery, that's not a benefit. But if the work is installed in a way that would only be understood if you showed a gallery view, then you should do that. So say, um, so one thing that of course, most of you are probably aware of, you know, everybody's images are showing as like these little, you know, images on the application. So scale is somewhat difficult, even though they have the AV sheets that show them the scale of the work. But sometimes you need that installation view to get it, to understand it, to say, oh my gosh, I had no idea that this work was either this tiny or this huge. So um what we what we often do is say you know show us your work and what you what you were thinking and oh yeah you def definitely need to submit an installation view a good example is Karen Snoffer who is an artist um in the Gambier area she met with me 2 years ago and we went through her work and we looked and and she had flat work but then she also had installation views and she even showed installation views from the side to show the dimension of her work. And, and it, it definitely helped in the understanding of her work because you just would not have been able to understand it unless you saw those installation views. Thank you. Um, kind of along the lines of things being displayed in different settings, um, somebody has asked, if you're submitting images that were exhibited in like a non-traditional environment and you're trying to capture an image and the lighting maybe isn't great um, and so the quality of the photo maybe isn't the best, do you get knocked on any of that or I mean, how is there? Um, slightly, I, I hate to say it, but slightly, um, but, but you know, artists, the people that are on our panels are artists and I think that sometimes they can either be really forgiving or they can be kind of harsh, depending. Um, if if it's a documentation issue that way because of the actual situation that the work is in, I think they tend to be a little bit more forgiving. If it's documentation and they're, you're taking photographs of your 2D, 2D pieces outside leaning against your house, that is gonna be a little bit more, they're gonna be more critical of that. Um, so what I'm saying is that 
they take into account for environmental issues when the work is in the environment. Um, so when we say try and have your work as documented as best as it can, one thing that is frustrating for a panel is if they see great promise in this work, but they just can't, they can't get a read on it. They don't know what is happening in this work. And so um, that's the unfortunate thing is if for some reason your documentation is not doing your work any favors. If it's, if it's a matter where you're, um, you've taken the photographs and you're like, well, this is the best I can do, um, it might ultimately affect how, how you fare in the review. Gotcha, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah. Um, next, let's see, can you or should you submit two different types of work within a discipline? So for example, painting and cut paper within 2D. That is a great question and uh, I'm, I'm glad whoever asked that. That is one that we get a lot. So the standard rule is if you have work that explores the same theme, if it's say a, a series of portraits, but using a number of different mediums, all 2D, but working within the mediums, but it's all portraiture, you can submit that. If it's work um, that is using the same medium, but possibly exploring different subject matter, you can, you can um, submit that. So it's almost like if there's consistency in either the subject matter or the medium, they can be considered one body of work. Do not do three paintings of trees, three, um, you know, prints of cats, you know, that type of, that doesn't really show that you've thought about an idea, you've explored an idea, this is a cohesive body of work, this is one thought. Um, that, that actually looks a little, you know, schizophrenic a little bit that you don't have a clear voice as an artist that you're exploring all these different options. It's perfectly fine for you to do all those different options. Uh, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that it doesn't make as strong an application in our process if you, if you apply it that way. Great, so it sounds like consistency and cohesion are key there. Yes, okay. yes. Perfect. And, and, and um, I, I, um, Asked Laura Sanders when I showed the, the images, I asked her if I was allowed to, if I could use her work. Um, because she is a 2D painter and she has a, a clear idea, a clear focus of her work, environmentalism, water, things like that. But, but she explores within that realm different aspects. She's added new elements. Um, things that make it look like they're almost on a screen or something like that. And so I thought she was a great example of that, that person that has, uses one medium, has one approach, has some slightly different subjects within her body of work. Um, I thought she was a good example to show. Yeah, for sure. And that was really helpful just to be able to see that on screen there so everybody could kind of get a visual of what that looks like. So thank you for including that. Sure. Um, let's see, we have time for maybe one or two more questions here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the definition um, and the differences between craft and visual arts 2D and 3D? Sure, so the, um, so I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier. So the way we think of it, or it's not actually us, but what we have seen in the past with our crafts panel, is that they really wanna know the process and how you've gotten to the end, end result. It's about the process as much as it is about the final product. The sculpture um, panel, and I, I, I hope I'm not offending any sculptors or craft people when I say this, but it seems like they just, they just want to see, they don't really care how you got there, they just want the end result, and they want to see how successful that end result is. Um, so, the, the hard part is when we have those folks that are sculptural craft people. You know, should they go into crafts? Should they go into sculpture? And typically, um, we ask them, we put it back on them and say, what do you see yourself as? Do you see yourself as a sculptor? Do you see yourself as a craft person? 
And if they say, oh, I'm definitely a sculptor, then they should go into the sculpture category. One thing that we do have is we have folks that have bodies of work that are both sculptural and also two-dimensional. So what should they go into? Should they go into 2D or should they go into sculpture? Um, what the rule of thumb is, whatever the majority of body of work is, is the panel that you should go to. So say you have eight sculptural pieces, but four wall elements in this body of work that you're submitting, you need to go into sculpture. But if it was the reverse, then you can go into, into visual arts 2D. Um, again, I'm always, uh, you know, we're always offering this. We would happily look at your body of work and make a suggestion if we think it would, if it would resonate better with our knowledge of the types of artists that we put on the different panels. Um, of course, that's always, you know, take it with a grain of salt. If you want to take our recommendations, perfectly fine. It has no influence on if you're recommended or not. But we, we do have a history of um, the types of work that come into the panel. So if your work potentially could seem out of place within a certain discipline, um, then we might recommend a different discipline to apply to. One thing I continuously, I put this in there um, when I was doing the slide deck, most importantly, if, if you are a sculptural um, person or if you do installation-based work and you have any kind of extra component that has audiovisual movement, you, performance, you need to go into interdisciplinary because you're limited to only doing digital images for visual arts 3D. And so it frustrates the panel when they can tell that there's a performance aspect, that there is movement aspect, that there is audio, but they don't get those support materials. So um, definitely go into interdisciplinary and your work will be viewed along other types of work that's the same type of work. So. All right, great, thank you. Um, we are actually coming up on our time here today. That was another incredibly fast hour. Um, so if we didn't get to your questions, like I said, no worries. We've been tracking all of your submitted questions, whether they're on Facebook or whether they came in through Zoom, and we will definitely follow up with you offline. Clearly, um, we have the experts here. They will get back to you on all of your questions. Um, if you have a more in-depth question and can benefit from some additional time with the IA team, Kathy and Katie are holding a limited number of one-on-one -on -one follow up sessions for our webinar attendees. So these are 15 minute virtual meetings. They're scheduled between three and 5 p.m. this coming Friday, May 29th, and space is limited. There are only eight slots available. So um, it's first come first serve basis. So go ahead and, and jump on that. Um, secure your spot by visiting the link you see there on your screen. And finally, Mark your calendars for parts two and three of the Individual Artist Programs webinar series. So on Wednesday, June 17th, Kathy, uh, she'll be back with OAC Folk and Traditional Arts contractor, Christina Benedetti, and they'll share information about resources and programs available to Ohio's folk and traditional artists. And then on Wednesday, July 8th, Katie will return and joining her will be Rice Gallery Director Kat Sheridan. And they'll talk about best practices for visual artists looking to break into the professional art realm. So we get a lot of questions about that. So you definitely don't want to miss those. Um, don't miss out on those exciting opportunities. You can look for more information about those on our webinars page. Um, it's oac.ohio.gov slash webinars. Um, that does it for today's presentation. Thank you again to Kathy and Katie for their guidance and their expertise. And thank you to everyone who took the time to tune in today. You should now have all of the information you need to hit submit with confidence. So thank you again, Kathy and Katie, for being thank here. You. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. I just want to remind our audience that the OAC has developed a section of our website with updates and resources for the arts and cultural sector that are related to COVID-19. We update this information frequently, so be sure to check back and stay up to date on all of that. Um, you can find that there, the um, web address on our screen there. So that does it for today. Thank you again, everyone. Stay well, and we will see you next month.